Praise the Lord. Do you love the King? Do you love our King Jesus? Isn't He so beautiful? Isn't God such a wonderful God? You know, we sing, sing these songs, you know, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. But the truth is, He really is awesome, you know. And it says, by the day spring of the tender mercies of God, we've been drawn to Him. He's just merciful, more than we think. God is so ridiculously kind. And one of the biggest struggles that we have is to actually understand His personal kindness toward us. I, I've met many people. I, I travel a, a lot. I go all over the world and, and it's great. <clears throat> and I meet many people. But one of the, the greatest problems that I see in the family of God is not, and I don't focus on the problems, I'm trying to focus on Him because He's always the answer. You know, your marriage, like our brother said earlier, your marriage is stuffed, more of Jesus. You, your body needs healing, more of Jesus, you know. And Catherine Kuhlman used to say, the healing takes place when Jesus becomes more present to you than the sickness. And, uh, and so the answer is always the Lord. But you know, sometimes the, the tender mercy of God, the part that causes me to be drawn to the Lord and be free of condemnation, sometimes condemnation can creep in really softly and swiftly and, and you don't even know it's there, but all of a sudden you, you just never feel like you're enough for God. And, uh, and the love, the tender mercy is what causes you to feel like you're enough. You know those moments where you're in your car and, and you just have to pull over to the side? You know those moments? And you just have to go on the side of the road because there's tears streaming down your face and you had that worship song on and, and just the presence of the Lord ministered to your spirit and unlock that kind of feeling of tiredness. And, and, uh, and I, I'm really on a goal in my own life just to not be tired before the Lord, but to be hungry, but to not motivate myself just out of discipline. Discipline is the lowest form of intimacy. It's the, it's the, it's the entry level of intimacy to the Lord, passion, First love, fire, union. These things are the highest form of intimacy with God. Discipline's great, but it'll only cause you, it will bring you to, maybe it will bring you to a place of function, but it will not bring you to a place of surrender. It, it will, it'll help you get there, but it cannot sustain you. In fact, if discipline replaces the passion, uh, you end up actually grieved inside at the reason you came to God. And that's difficult because then you feel like you're never enough in the presence of the Lord which means the, the praise and the, the life is headed that way, but it's not headed back to you, which means you become very dry. You become very self-abrasive and, and these things don't help the presence of God in your life. You're meant to be in love with your King. God is love. He's not a heavy burden, heavy yoking God. Oh, but Ben, don't we have to serve in the church? Of course you serve, but I'm not stacking a chair so someone can pat me on the back. I'm stacking a chair because I love Jesus. I used to, when I was in Bethel, I, I was a pastor, you know, and I used to, I wanted to be so right with God. You know, Bill Johnson, this man from Bethel Church, I don't know if you know this church I'm speaking to you about, but this man, he said to me once, he said, Ben, you know, he's like, you're, you're a bit similar to me. And he goes, you're going to have to watch out that, you know, just, just to be aware and conscious of, of the fact that you might go to extremes at times. You'll try an extreme serve. You'll try an extreme. And he goes, but God wants you to also know that He loves you. He's with you. And He's a good God, you know. And, and you can just do things because of joy. He goes, you'll, go to ex you'll say something extreme, then you'll go to extreme regret. <laughs> and he said, you, you want to make sure that you notice in your own soul that you're not being too hard on yourself, that you're being soft to yourself. I don't know why I'm saying this. This is not the, what I'm going to share with you. I just felt to share that with someone. Like maybe you really truly love God. I loved the worship. It was so beautiful back then. It was so powerful. I like how the lights went off in one part too. I love that. That was amazing. <laughs> but I loved the worship so much and it was so, so beautiful and so innocent. Um, but, you know, I just want to encourage you. Jesus is love. God loves you. What good would it do you if, if He bankrupted heaven? and bled for your soul, only to have you for the rest of your life berate the soul that He died to save. How does that work? It doesn't last very long. I've suffered deeply with condemnation as a Christian, and the condemnation wasn't necessarily even just the enemy attacking me. It was my own drive to be so deep with God and further with God. And sometimes I would just draw myself into a place where I'm never doing enough. And when you're never enough, the problem is in that place, your mind begins to, to stay in a place where it's always got something to do, which means you can never rest, which means you can never receive. In order to receive, your hands have to be empty. They've got to be empty. You have to rest a little, you know? 
Jesus even said this to the disciples in the midst of a very tumultuous time. He said, draw aside with me and rest a little while. And they did. And Jesus went up and was with his father. And, you know, you can look at God many ways. You can slice the Lord in many ways in terms of the dexterity of revelation. I love my Bible very, very much. And I can see God in many angles. And I love preaching what Paul called the full counsel and not withholding that from the family of God. The full counsel of God's revelation, everything about God. He's a righteous judge, yes, but He's the Lord, the healer. Yes, He's Jehovah Shema, the Lord with us. He's all these things, you know, the Lord is, He's not, He doesn't play games with people. And there's so many camps in Christianity. There's so many rivers, you know. We're in the river of pray all night. We're in the river of soak all day. We're in the river of evangelism. We're in the river of, some people are just, they are the river, they call themselves, you know. There's, there's so much stuff and all of it's wonderful because they're all expressions of this amazing diamond called the Lamb of God. They're all expressions, but sometimes what we do is we anchor ourselves on one part of God's nature and then we continually Basically, we check ourselves against that part of the nature of God. And if you do that and you don't let the nature of His love minister to you, you end up in a place where you actually become, in a sense, uh, subservient to the Lord because you're not really giving your life. And this happened to me. In fact, the Lord changed me and gave me an encounter that changed my life on a golf course. I used to go and pray at a golf course. I'd go at 10, 11 o'clock at night and there was kangaroos there in Australia. It's pretty cool, you know. So the only thing I'd feel when I'm praying, seeking the Lord, I'd feel this person come behind me and it was a kangaroo and um and and it was kind of scary sometimes but a whole group of them would come and I'd be out there in the fifth green seventh green whatever by myself and I could just shout to the Lord and just Jesus you know I want you use my life and all this stuff and then one time I was sitting down on the golf course and and it's late late at night and and I was just like God I mean I've been crying out for hours and that was hours upon days upon months upon a long time and I said God And I said, I have these feelings inside when I'm coming to you that I actually, I have to be honest with you because I always wanted to be like David because when I read David, I'm sure you're like, I wanna be a man after your very own heart. And David was so real. He wasn't fake. I can't stand the things of ingenuineness. I wanna be real. Even if I'm real the wrong way, I'd rather be real, if that makes sense, you know? And so I'd always be honest with God. I'd go, God, I, I come to you, but I'm tired. I'd be honest with Him, you know? But you are the, I'd declare the things. You are the strength. You are my, you know, I always try to end with what is the right thing to say. And eventually after several years of doing that and, and this particular time, I was really battling certain sins I wanted to overcome and, and I was just yelling and I said, God, I said, I pray to you so often. I'm here all the time, you know, and I said, but something inside me, sometimes it feels like I actually, like I, I hate you. Like something feels like I don't like you because I don't feel like you answer me all the time. And, and he, you know what he said to me? It was so profound. God has a way of answering you that does two things at once. It pierces you, makes you feel like, it's like 10,000 light bulbs going around you. Like, oh yeah, how simple is this? And the other thing it does is it actually brings you down. It brings you to a place of, you actually love me. You know what the Lord said? He said, and because I was trying to be honest, I said, God, forgive me. I confess to you. I've had these thoughts of like kind of bitterness toward you because I come here all the time and pray and I'm always seeking you. And I don't know if you, you, it feels like you rarely answer me with major things you answer me, but I want more God and I'm just hungry, you know. You know what the Lord said to me? The golf course. Because I said, God, forgive me for any thought of hatred towards you. I'm sorry if I have any hate or anger towards you. And you know what the Lord said? He goes, he goes, you don't hate me. He goes, you hate who you think I am. <laughs> Some of you didn't get that. You don't, you love God. Why would I be at a golf course at 12 at night? You love God. The frustration isn't with the Lord. The frustration is you think He's harsh. You think God's hard on you. You think He's a God who dangles a carrot and withholds from you that which is good. He doesn't do that to you. And so you beat yourself and you, and you try and get better and, and God doesn't want to improve you. He, he was always about killing you, not improving you. <laughs> Jesus came, didn't He, as the second Adam. Your first inheritance was from the first Adam. You could do nothing about it. Your first inheritance, you were getting up in the morning destined for sin and hell. You were getting up in the morning. You were not to better that life. Jesus came to kill that life. You know, many Christians, they're going to heaven, living the same way that they were headed to hell. While they were headed to hell, they were trying to live self-improved life, be a good person, do things well. And then they become a Christian. They try and do things well, self-improve, prove themselves to God. What is the difference? They were trying to live a good life heading to hell. Now they're trying to live a good life heading to heaven. There is no difference. They're still tired. They're still not at rest inside the nature of God in the man. 
And that's the whole point, isn't it? When they're in the midst of the garden, do you see Adam striving with God? But I'm not talking about prayer. You might think, well, we should pray out loud. I don't care how loud it is. You can have you can have a megaphone and pray. God doesn't care how loud. God cares about the posture of where your prayer comes from and what your prayer expects. God spoke to me uh, last year. I was praying for sick people and I love miracles a lot, especially deliverance. In fact, Pastor Vlad said to me, he said, I'm, I'm the white guy of deliverance. I don't know what that meant exactly, but he was like, I'm the white boy of deliverance, you know, because usually these big African ministers, you know, they have like a lot of deliverance ministries and he called me the white boy. I like that. It's kind of cool. I am a white boy. I need to get out in the sun more often. But, um, but and there's no race comment in that, by the way. So just so you understand, he just meant like, not a lot of, usually it's the Africans in the big long robe, I'll come out of thee and all that stuff, you know? And, and I'm just an Aussie guy who's like, get out demons, get out. You know, I'm very, I don't like demons. Um, you know, but I lost my point then. The enemy's trying to steal the sermon. Get out in Jesus' name. And um, isn't he good? These little notes he does to help. Pray. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was praying for the sick a lot. I was praying to cast out demons a lot. I wanted more breakthrough. My father, he had... The enemy really attacked my father and he committed suicide. So I want to break through. I'm like, we need to fight the enemy. We need to go after the enemy. We need, I don't want to just stand back and watch him take the world to hell. I want to fight. And uh, I was praying for people and I'm like, God. And, and I just got into this rhythm as a pastor of people coming to me saying, hey, I have a bad back. Hey, my sister, she's got a frozen shoulder. Hey, you know, my best friend, they can't have kids or whatever. Or my, my family is a train wreck. My son's gone away from God. And, and so I became pastoral in my prayers. And the Holy Spirit last year, as I had my hand on someone's back, said, Ben, um, you're not praying. And I was like, what, what do you mean? And, you know, I knew what he meant, but I was like, what? And he's like, um, you're praying prayers. He goes, it would be better that you say nothing because you're not praying a prayer with any expectation that I'm actually about to do it. You're praying a prayer to comfort her. The posture matters to God. The words didn't mean anything. Oh, thank you, Lord. We just declare this back gets healed. That can be so superficial. You can be almost praying her out of the equation so you don't have to have faith. And the Lord said, don't pray those prayers to me. He said, that's not a prayer that you're expecting me to answer. Put your hand on her back and command her back to be healed. That's a prayer of faith. That's a prayer according to God's nature, not Ben's nature. See, in Ben, Ben can't heal. Ben can't keep himself sinless. It's all to the glory of God. God can heal. God can deliver you. God can, God can, God will, God, God does. The only thing that is in between you and the Lord in terms of the fact that we're a newborn creation, if we believe 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 18, down, all the way down to 20, because the ambassador part matters as well. But if we believed that verse, even just one verse that we are so very familiar with, it says all things have become new, all. Which means there's no area. Listen to this for just for a second. Think about Jesus, okay? When he, when he stepped on the earth, was He the fullness of God in a man? Yes. Did he, did he operate in, did He open the eyes of everybody and say, there's the 12 legions of angels behind me. Did He always display the white raiment of His light that says it's blinding, impossible for you to look at the face of God and live? Did He always display that? No, right? He kept it hidden. But He did, it, the Scripture is very clear. Jesus said to the Father, I manifested your glory. So he didn't keep it all hidden. He just, there's a heavenly glory and Jesus took on an earthly form in that glory. But there's more to him. The craziest part to me though is the guy who fashioned the universe with God. And by the way, some people stumble over the God of the Old Testament thinking, how can God tell David to kill all those Philistines? Do you understand that Jesus Christ was sitting next to God as the Father would give a command to David or tell an angel to give instruction to David? Jesus Christ was sitting there watching every decision in the Old Testament that the Father made and saying, well done, Father, that is a good decision. Do you understand that? It says, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus didn't come to the earth and say, I'm going to improve your nature. He came as God Himself. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, God in a man, God back in the man God made, the second Adam, the final Adam. That's how He came. But when Jesus came to earth, the Father had a mission for Him called a cross. And that cross, that mission that He took on was not a mission of like, Jesus is going to die on the cross and save the world. The mission wasn't just salvation. The salvation, the soterio, which you mentioned, that salvation is not just saved. It's, it's the deliverance of life. 
Pastor Lana mentioned that before with this beautiful, amazing lady, Anna, her testimony. You know, the, the Spirit of the Lord came to restore the union that was between God and man, that humanity as a race would be God covenanted all the time, that every country, every citizen, every nation, and that's what will happen. When we get to heaven, every person there will be God connected, God one and God covenanted, everyone. You won't have to go, hey, how, how much are you connected to God? Everybody, God will be in them all, it says in the book of Isaiah. God will teach them all. But Jesus, when He went to that cross, the fullness of God in a man, He put every single thing of the future, the world to come, your life, your heart, your struggle, your pain, all the things that you would be enduring as a temptation, the devil's warfare, everything, every sickness, He put it all inside the elements, two elements. God factored in, it's so brilliant of God. It's such a thing to agree to a mindset that is so high and lofty, they can't understand this. But God put Himself into a flesh and then placed Himself into two elements of that flesh, which is the body of Jesus being beaten, ribbons torn off His flesh for your healing for your body, for your life, for your body to actually resonate with God's power. And the second thing was, and it wasn't just the healing of sickness, it's the prosperity of soul. And then the second thing, the blood, which is a propitiation for sin, which actually cleanses the man in order for the nature to be changed in the man. He put all of the things that you would ever need inside two elements. When you hold that body and that blood, everything for the whole future of humanity as a second race, a new creation, second Adam race was put into that body. It's pretty amazing. So that when you commune with God, everything that was false about God in your mind is surrendered. Everything that you thought God was only in one nature, it's surrendered. You see Him as He is so that you can become the way He called you to be. He put it all in the cross, in one man. Isn't that phenomenal? So that when you pray, you don't have to hope. When you call on God, you don't have to think He's a harsh, faraway God. You can actually believe the Gospel. Many believers are not honest with the Lord. They keep going and going and going and then burnout happens. The only reason burnout happens isn't because their intimate life was waning. They're like, well, I didn't pray as much. That's not the cause of burnout. The cause of, you can be praying heaps and still burn out. The cause of burnout is that they didn't understand the person they were praying to. What does Hebrews 4 say? Let us boldly approach the throne. If Pastor Vlad says, you can boldly pat my dog, I'm not going to go, hey dog, you know, and t -t tap him. I'm going to go, hey, come here. I'm going to, I'm going to, hello, hello boy. I'm going to act as if like he's my friend, the dog, because you've given me access to the dog. If they say, you can sleep in this bed, they were so kind to me. They had me over to the house. They're so very kind as pastors. Very, you have amazing leaders. I've only met Pastor Vlad and Pastor Lana for like, less than 24 hours. But already I'm like, they are wonderful people. I thoroughly enjoyed being freezing on the balcony last night. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed it. But they gave me their bed and they were so sweet. They're like, here's a brand, they gave me a brand new towel. They made me feel like I was boldly welcomed. She didn't go, don't touch that towel too much. Only just, just dry your elbow. <laughs> I don't want that Australian smell on my towel. <laughs> That's why you have a good washing machine. She, they boldly welcome me. God boldly welcomed us. Who you pray to, who you understand to be God is the very thing that whets your appetite for hunger. If you think He's a God that is just starving you, like an, He's not the master of an orphanage. If you think He is, He will be. Because your conscience won't perceive the goodness that He wants to pour out on you. Sometimes the Lord tells me to be quiet. And He's not telling me to be quiet, so it's a quiet time, so I can learn the, the stillness. People, we over-spiritualize so much that my main concern right now in the modern day church is that spiritual language is being used as a currency for the church because people are sounding so very close to God, but they're not, which means they don't have living bread, which means they can tell you how intimate and all this stuff about God, they could not cast a demon out if you tried. They have no oil in their lamp. Intimate language, like even big movements right now, people are like, there's stuff happening in our family. We need to get back to this simple love for Jesus. We need to get back to this simple obsession with the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I'm serious, man. God is, I'm so compelled by this right now. I'm like, everything that's fake has to go. Even in me, I'm like, God, get that. I see the motivation there, Jesus. And it says, you clearly will judge the hearts of man. Everything will be seen in secret. Corinthians can't lie. Paul said it, he goes, it will all be on display. Therefore, by the terrors of the Lord, I persuade men. 
It's a terrifying thing to be on display having lived a fake world, to be in the most real world ever. But if you just get real, then you can boldly approach the most real God ever. It's so good. And then you can become what the world actually needs. Then you can pray prayers that change people instead of just sounding religious. Is this the fast I've chosen to beat yourself up? One of the major points of Isaiah 58, God's literally changed my entire walk with Him through Isaiah 58. I love fasting. I've done 40 days, 28 days, 21 days, I've done all that. And I think that you guys are on something in the Spirit in your fast because of the heart posture. That's what the Lord looks at. But I've been in times where like God says to me, Isaiah 58, 7, Ben, He told me to go to those verses. And you know what it says? It says, do not hide yourself from your own flesh. You can go into the prayer closet, cry out and think you're doing God a good service, but the Lord's asking you to actually fall in love with Him and go and take Him to some hurting person. The Lord said to me in Redding, California, He said, son, you pray a lot, but you hide yourself from your own flesh. And I had to ask Him, who's my flesh, God? He said, your neighbours, your unsaved family and friends. The church isn't your own flesh. Those who don't know me are. That's why I died. That's why I died for you. I believe your fast is God ordained. I'm not knocking that at all. I'm not even mentioning that with that in mind, just so you're clear. I don't want, sometimes when you say something and someone's related to it in the crowd, they think it was at you, not at all. Had zero to do with that fast. I actually think it's fully of God. In fact, it's, it's someone rang me yesterday and said, I feel Ben, you need to go on another fast. And so when they're talking about it, it's actually doubling the conviction on me. So I, I'm very convicted. And for sure we were feasting last night and for sure we'll feast again today before the fast begins. I encourage you, put some weight on before. Pack it in, make it a good day today, all right? Make it a feasting day. But what does the Lord require? What does the Lord desire? Here's the Pharisee. Thank you, I fast twice a week. I give one tenth of my income. Someone walks in, beats their head on their chest, won't even raise their face to heaven. Jesus said, which one went home in the sight of God? Justified. Justified being just as if I never sinned. Which one went home with a pure conscience? The one who was real. The one who came to God and said, here I am, Lord. God, you know what? I come to you and I pray all the time, but actually I see you as a father who withholds from me. I don't believe that you're always good. I believe I have to prove it and then maybe I'll get something from you. Father, I'm sorry. I've bankrupted your nature. You're nothing like that. I've seen you be kind to so many people, but I think you're not kind to me. Paint a bullseye on me, Jesus. Wreck me with your kindness. That's the God we serve. God, I thank you that I can have such compassion when I pick up a little African kid and love on him. But when you look at me, you think of me the same way but I don't believe it, God. Therefore be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the will of God. How can I prove God's good? Because I feel He's good. Because I know He's good to me. How can I prove God can heal? Because I pray and I know He's healer. How can I prove the anointing is real? Because I know that power was given to me to do the work of the Lord, not just to somebody else, not just for someone who can prove it better than I can to God. But Ben, what does the faithful steward stuff come into it? Where does it come in the balance of you must be faithful for sure. You gotta be 100% faithful. But discipline, as I said, is the lowest form of discipleship. Faithfulness because of passion is. I know Pastor Lana and Pastor Vlad. When Pastor Vlad looks at her, he's not like, I'm gonna discipline myself to hug her today. He doesn't think that way. In fact, he told me that last night. He was like, I knew, I knew when I met her, I knew I liked her. Yeah, he knew. Have you ever seen two brand new married couples? They walk down the street like this, they don't think you're alive. They think they're, their love story is all that matters to them. They're like this, oh, I love you. And, you're, and people, older people walk past, that's disgusting. And you're just jealous. <laughs> it's not disgusting. You're just like inside, you're like that old guy. I've seen people in Germany where I live and we have these big stadium events and God is touching Germany. Thousands of people are being saved. Trust me, there's amazing things happening. Not just Germany, all over Europe. It's been very powerful. But I sit in the German restaurants, Pastor, and I sit there and I watch them like this. How's your schnitzel? Hmm, bit better than last week. Good. And they're dead. They live together, but really alone. I've met many Christians, but they're dead. They live together, but really alone. And then you meet these nine month old ones who come out of the, 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 the womb of God and they're like, do you guys wanna pray today? And you're like, we have a football game. It starts at four out the, you know, the Seahawks are playing at four. And, and they're, like, they're like, awesome, we can pray in the break. And we're like, mm, okay. And you can't say no, because you know it's right. 
What would it be if you just actually were like, yes, let's pray. Why do you think God meant for prayer, loving the lost, loving the Lord, all of that to be a duty? And let's see how you do. And when you get to heaven, I'll give you joy. What a joke. I don't want that Christianity, do you? Most of us are sick, sad and disgusted and heaven's our home that we get out of this bad world for. Why did the Holy Spirit enter me? So the second Adam's life could be in mine. I'm not left to the the depletions of Ben. Ben cannot give me joy, the Holy Spirit can. The Lord loves you. The Lord has a plan for you. He loves you, friend. He doesn't want you to beat yourself up anymore. What's it doing for you? Self-abasement, judgment, criticism, condemnation. Where is it getting you with God? Closer or further? If you don't think this is biblical, I've already mentioned about 10 Scriptures. I can give you some more. (laughs) Vlad said the very verse that I wanted to read. He said it as he was introducing me. Didn't know that. I like when that happens. I was going to read this to you. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you. Therefore, brethren, ready? By the tender, soft, squishy, huggy, by the tender mercy of God. As if Jesus was like, hey, 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 we're a holy family. It's not like this. Are you holy? You're a joke if you're not holy. That's not Jesus. I beseech you by the tender, soft, oh, forgiven. Lord, I lay my head on the pillow and there's no condemnation because all my sin has been removed. Oh, the tender mercy of God. There's no way I want to go back to porn. Oh, the tender mercy of God. To present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. For this is your act of service and praise to the Lord. This is so good. This is better than I'm going to, oh, let me preach to this woman. This is better than you're getting. You understand? Do you understand that it is not, okay, in this life will you have trouble? Yeah. Did Paul say sleeplessness is often, fasting's often. We're persecuted, we're called the filth of the world, as if the scourge of this world, yet you are blessed. Us apostles, the least of all people. Now apostles, all they want is they want a a business card and everybody to knock on their door like they're the Messiah. Now apostles are so prideful. Oh, do you know how many churches we have, brother? It's a joke. One prayer meeting I'll never forget about hearing about. It was here in the United States. There was a group of pastors all together and Pastor Yongi Cho was visiting. And when he came to visit, this guy had no idea who this Asian man was. If you don't know who Yongi Cho is, Yongi Cho has a church of 750,000 people. And Yongi Cho is a humble man. And he came here to America. And this guy with all these leaders in Texas said, goes, <clears throat> goes well, they're all standing. He goes, let's pray. And he goes, well, I guess I better pray considering my church is the biggest in town. And he was holding hands with Yongi Cho. His church was 5,000. The Holy Spirit said to me once, He said, Ben, numbers don't mean a lot. He said, do you know Jesus, Ben, can speak to billions of people at once every day, at once? Having, can you fathom this? He can have two billion more if he wanted to, but even just what well, the population of Christians are, one to 1.8 billion, He can have 1.8 billion individual conversations at the same moment all together at one time. While he's telling you one thing, he's telling the next person what different. He can talk 8.1 billion combos at once. He's texting everyone. (laughs) Oh, I've got the biggest church. An apostle, a person of God is one who said, here is my will. Here is my life, good and faithful Father. How is it that you would go to the cross for me, for one who is so embedded in darkness and you would take on those nails and you would allow them to drive those things covered in rust and blood and covered in the curse of sin. Drive those through my hands and crush, put that that crown of thorns. I mean, it says they drove it into him with sticks into his mind and they drove that crown into his brain so that you could have a mind of peace. This is Jesus of the apostles and Paul the apostle. I've got nothing against offices and buildings. I have an assistant. It's hard for people to get a meeting with me without going through my assistant because if they ask me, they won't get it because I'll forget it. But she remembers it. But I don't care about the, there's no pecking order. There's honour. There's archangels. There's double honour for elders. Those things are biblical. But there's never a place where it says an elder can have more pride. Paul said that we are the greatest of servants. 
We're the ones who are the debased ones. We're sacrificing on our knees. We're up there in the mountain crying out, God, save Ephesus. When you're out there drinking, having a great time, we're the ones considered the scourge of the world. We're the ones being attacked and persecuted by the devil. We're the ones in the spiritual war when you're out there having fun watching football on Sunday. But that's the life of the apostles. That's the joy of that. So present your bodies because He's so tender, merciful, holy and good. Present it, go, here's porn. I fed on that. What a security. Here's people's opinion. I love how they double tap. They like me. I love when they mention me and things. I love that. That's fed me a bit, but He is so good. This just feeds a bit and it leaves me wanting more afterwards. It is like sugar. But the salt of the earth, the life of the world, the goodwill of God toward man is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And your body is His temple, but He's good to you. He loves you. He doesn't sit there with arms crossed, ready to shoot you down. He's trying to raise you up. He's a good father. I'll share this before I finish and I want to pray for people. I don't want to go too long, but I just, man, I just honestly, I just want to worship God. I I, I hear things, guys, I don't want to make you down. I want to tell you more about the jewels and the heavenly things of God, the the precious stones that will abide when the conveyor belt of the fire of God tries the work of man, that the precious stones, the real love for Jesus, the genuine outcry for God, the heart that is purified, refreshed, because it's God in you, not you in you, not you trying so hard, but God inside you working to do according to His good will and pleasure, like it says in Philippians 2. That's God inside your life. That's that's how you do the works of God because you let God come in and go, hey, but we have this thing called a free will. And people right now are manufacturing intimacy. There's groups out there right now, they're, gonna, they're like, and it's not Bethel, it's not people maybe even know, they're like, we're gonna write 120 songs in three months, that's our goal. How do you do that with oil on it? How do you write 103 songs a day or whatever with oil? Where does that stuff come from? It comes from, I love production, multiplication, we multiply, I love all that. You should see our team. We're like, raise up leaders, raise up leaders. That's all we wanna do. But I don't want to raise up leaders who think that this thing is the definition of Christian success. This thing. You can have it. You won't go home with joy just because of this. You will because of this. (laughs) We need that. We need to redefine again the simplicities of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, Paul said, I warn you. And he said, I'm troubled that, that the same way that the serpent deceived Eve, your mind may be drawn away from the simplicity that's in the Christ. What kind of drawing? What did Satan do with Eve? You know what he, Satan said to God? He goes, he goes, I'll be greater than you. And you know what happened? Lightning button, bang, he's on the earth. God pushed a button, he's gone. He said, and he took one third of the angels. Ezekiel 28 says, by the multitude of his trading, he caused one third of the angels to fall. How could you be in the very glory of God, looking face to face at God? The eminence of life coming out of you. In heaven, there is no lack of joy. Every angel has joy. They're not up there like with wounds. Oh, I need a coffee with you, Michael. I'm struggling. They're not like that. They're living for, for they're, they're fully able to abide in that river of God. But by the multitude, it says, of his trading. The Hebrew word they're trading is gossip. He went to the angels. Oh, oh, you don't, you're beautiful, but has God told you that you're an amazing angel? Has God stepped off his throne and, and given you a better position? Has God sold you something? Don't you know you should be preaching more? And he gossiped and convinced, yeah, I I, I deserve more. There's something missing from me. And he used the same wisdom with Eve. Said there's something missing with you and God. He knows that if you eat that, you're a different person. And God is dangling a carrot. He's not as good as you think. And that simple trust, like a kid, like Eve had, all of a sudden was corrupted from the simplicity of God loves me. God would give me anything. He's such a good dad. Didn't he surely promise? All the promises of God in him are yes and amen. All that Abrahamic seed has gone into me because it went into one man Christ. All Abraham's promises are mine. All of the things that God said are headed toward me like a bullseye because he really is good. But the devil knows how to get your mind and take it away. And you know what he said to God? He said, I'll be greater than God. He can't be, can he? Can he go up there and go, excuse me, I'd like you to quit. He doesn't even have a voice to do those things. Again, the lightning button. He'll fall again like lightning. What's the next best thing? If I can't be greater than God, I'll be greater than God in their mind. 
in God's very own children on the earth. I'll get into their conscience and I'll sit on the seat of the throne of their mind and rule them by the temptation for them to become something outside of God. I'm going to become great. God is great. God in a man. God feeding a woman. That's God who's great. Satan's a liar. Jesus is the truth. Okay, this is the last thing I'll share with you. By the way, when preachers say that, they're lying. That this really is the last thing. Is this speaking to any of you? If I'm preaching to one man and one woman and they're convicted, I'm, I'm good. Hello. Hello, live streamers, by the way. I love you all. I have to say hello there, but I'm here. Hello, look at you, Constantine. Bless you. I'll give you a fist bump. I love you very much. God bless you, these beautiful people. Guys, burn for King Jesus. Give everything to your King. Don't live for what man can sell. It's, it will only sell you short of what God wants to give. Don't think He's a harsh God. He's a God that doesn't want to condemn. And I finish with this. <laughs> I was fasting, long fast. I was getting ready for Awakening Europe. That's our ministry in Europe. And uh, I said, God, I really want you to, to really change me. And, and so I put this worship stuff on for two, three hours a day. And I just stopped eating, you know. And I started doing juice, like beetroot juice and things like beets and stuff, you know, carrot juice and stuff. And um, I started praying and it was really quite good. But halfway through, I'm like, something's missing. I feel like I've been not eating for like 21 days or something, and, and, or 22 days. And I'm like, it hasn't changed me yet. And I just heard so clearly from the Spirit of God, switch to water. So I did. And then all of a sudden it was like, like heaven turned on me. And I was just hearing the Lord in a different way. And, and it's like something changed. I can't explain that. And there's no law around that. I'm not telling you that that's a law. It was just what God told me. But on like the 38th day, still I felt something inside like, God, I'm crying out so much. I'm really pressing in. But I want to be changed I don't want to be touched. I don't want to just have a mark. I want you to change me. And so something took place and I, I got on the floor and I was kind of weak by the time. And, um, and I had my worship on again. And I got on the floor and I had my head down like this. Like that. I was right down on the ground like this. And I was like that. And as I had, had my head like that on the ground, the Lord, as I, my head was facing the carpet, the Lord himself walked into my room. How did I know it was God? I, I felt two feet step right near me, in front of me, two feet. And each foot had fire in it, like fire coming off it. And when it stepped close to me, I knew it's not an angel. You just know Jesus. It doesn't, he's like, he doesn't have to announce himself very hard. And all of a sudden I was like, <laughs> I was like, Jesus, Jesus. And I'm, I'm looking into the carpet and this fire hit my head and went all through my body. And I was like, Jesus. And he didn't say anything. He just stood there and it got hotter and hotter and hotter. The scripture calls God an all-consuming fire. It's what he is. And so I'm like, Jesus. And now I'm crying. God, you take my life and everything. And it was all genuine. It's very genuine. And then I see as my face is buried into the carpet, I see a huge piece of metal like this, huge, wide. You know when you drive underneath a train track bridge and you see that big thick piece of bronze rusted metal? You know that look? Like that, the big fat piece, not thin, huge. I see this big thing in front of me covered in bronze and it's rusted, it's old, it's not holy, it looks bad, it doesn't look good. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, Jesus, Jesus. And he's standing in front of me with his two feet there saying nothing. And I say, Jesus, change me. Jesus, change me. I let go. Jesus, I let go. That kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, I see fire like whoosh, hit the middle of this huge slab of metal. And I heard the sound like it was such a weird sound. I could never recreate it with my mouth. It was like, whoosh, like a weird, the noise of metal bending. I don't know if you've ever heard metal bend. Maybe some of you who are engineers or in a shop, you know, but it was something like off Transformers where they knock down a pole and it bends. Or it was like a sound effect. It was so strange. I, I heard the noise of metal bending in this fire was touching the middle of this huge slab of metal. Then I hear as I'm watching this and I'm like, <laughs> you know, and I don't know what's going on. And as I'm watching, 
I hear Jesus speak from above to me like this, that it goes through my heart. Okay, I didn't see him audibly or physically, but I felt the physical fire. And I knew there was feet standing right there. He said this, Ben, like that, so the tender mercies of God. He said, Ben, yield to me. And when you've done that, yield again. And when you've done that, yield again. Three times. And then he disappeared. And I'm like this. <laughs> At the end of it, I was like, God. And I got up off the ground crying, you know, it was a mess. I couldn't just leave, I was a mess. And I got up off the ground. As I got up off the ground, I was like, Jesus, Jesus. And something inside felt different. I was like, Jesus, God, thank you. Softer, just settled peace. And I couldn't, I was troubled. I couldn't help but think, what is that metal? What the heck was that about? The metal. And so I said later on that day, I said to God, you know, he just asking me like, God, what was that about? I said, God, what was this huge slab of metal that I saw? You know what he said to me? He said, son, that was your will. And it stopped me. I was like, oh no. It was like a second encounter, but I didn't feel condemned because I'd already been bent. But I was like, oh God. And I said, God, I'm so sorry how stiff I can be. You tell me to go and talk to that person at the grocery store and I can clearly know it's you. My heart begins to beat and I just ignore you. You tell me to just come and pray and love on you, just be with you, but I'm there just for my agenda to tick off. I did my hour of prayer and now I feel like a self-righteous Christian. You come here to the fountain of your word and you're not looking for God. You're looking just to make sure you finish that chapter and all these hard things in the will. And my football will come before your presence. Or my this becomes before your presence. Now remember, there's no legalism in God. He can talk to you in the football game. He can talk to you while you're watching Gladiator. He does with me. I want to cut every devil's head off. <laughs> Braveheart, all of those ones. I'm like, that's me. I'm Braveheart, Jesus. <laughs> but how stubborn the will is. The only thing separating you from true joy is your will. And some of your wills is, I'm going to will to show God how much I can prove myself to Him. And He's like, wouldn't you just let go? I'd like you just to actually receive the Spirit of the Lord because then I'll be through you and the work will be to my glory, not yours. Some of your self-condemnation, you're not letting go of it. You're like, but I know I I haven't pleased God. Well, that's your pride because you're telling God that your prideful thought about how bad you are is actually bigger than God's love for you. So therefore you're telling God that His nature cannot work effectively. That means that your will is stiff because you're not letting Him burn that place in you and just go, I actually really do love you. I want you to believe in my love. This morning, this afternoon, the Lord wants to do some house cleaning. He wants to come into your heart and He wants to take away anything that causes that big, thick piece of metal to keep you stuck in the same kind of cycles with God, even if it's a dead religious cycle, even if it's the pride of ministry. And guys, you're an amazing worship team, but remember, remember, we're not worshipping who becomes the best worshipper. You know, Francis Chan, the guy came to Francis Chan and said to him, I don't like the worship in your church. And Francis Chan said, that's okay, we're not worshipping you. There's no celebrities in heaven. There's only ones who are intimate Levites, intimate lovers. And that's who you're going to be. Because the Russian communities I've gone to around the world, some of it's just a show. Not here. Here, you love the Lord. But I've been to some churches in Russia, other places, just a show. It's all a big show. And the pastors treat their wives like garbage. I've been there. I've seen it. It's wrong. It's fake. It's not real love for Jesus and real love for people. It's not about this stage, this thing is not about us. It's about feeding Him and feeding them. And then what He gives back to us is maybe He'll even make your name great among the nations like He did David. He'll make your fame increase. Maybe He will. And that's not to be despised. But the heart posture is, I want to love you. I want people to love you more. The heart posture is always to the King of the universe. Because at the end of the day, we're going to stand before that throne and that worship song. And we're going to see how in tune we are with their worship band. (laughs) Would you like to be in tune with the glory? Would you like to be filled with God? 
Okay, then forsake whatever it is today and be vulnerable with the Lord. Stop playing the game of trying to be tough. Stop playing the game of sitting there. Well, I'm a good man. I'm a good Ukrainian businessman here in Pasco and I'm not, I don't show much emotion to God. That's rubbish. You yell at the football team when they go the wrong goal. You get passionate, but here for Jesus, you're afraid. Listen, you've got to let go of all that garbage and nonsense and actually come to the throne of God and be real. The Lord loves you. And for those who self-condemn, for those who pick on themselves and harden their own conscience and try and serve to be seen, that is not the goal. Serve because you love God. He'll give you a nation to serve. Love God, love people. It's the simplicity of Christ. Don't let a snake in. But what is in the way this morning? Let it be out of the way. Come to the altar with whatever it is that keeps your will there and let the fire of God yield it again. Even if you're in ministry team, it doesn't matter. I travel the whole world. If I told you the things I know behind closed doors, you would be shocked. It makes me feel gross. I don't wanna boast of what the enemy's done to infect people, but he's infected our house with performance. And I have taken the bait before. I'm not telling you I haven't. I have so many times wondered how I can grow Ben instead of be possessed by God. It's so much better that way. Forsake that this morning, this afternoon. It's morning in Europe or evening. Get down here without fear of man now, if that is you. If I'm talking to you and you know it, without fear, I mean fast. If you're a leader, who cares? If you're on the worship team, who cares? You gotta let go of all that junk. Even if you're like, no, I'm supposed to be on a musician thing right now, it doesn't matter. Get down here and let go of all that junk. If you know I'm talking to you this morning, and some of you will stay seated because you'll be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just give your life back to God. Let Him yield you again. Behold the tender mercies of the Lord, for the Lord is good. He's tender and He's long-suffering. And Jesus wants to pour His glory out in you. Come as close as you can, all of you, just come. I don't want anyone to stay in their seat. And if you're like, there's no, there's no room, then just stand up in your seat. And you came down this morning, you're forgiven. You've already been set free but He wants to give more. What a precious man. The Lord loves those who give more. But here's the deal. When we begin to pray right now, Pastor Vlad's gonna help me and pray. When we begin to pray right now, if you're tired, you need to allow the Lord's mercy to flow back to you as you give Him your heart, okay? Because the temptation would be to come down here and beg and not receive. God doesn't want you to beg. God wants you to come and go, here's my will. And then God's gonna go, here's my will.